So what's the purpose of uh, the Clarity Chat? Our friend Vijay Ramchandran has been researching this subject for 25 years now. And very starkly, it's only 17% of technology projects that achieve the intended uh, business benefits. Now, why does this happen? This happens because IT is more complex than what we think it is. Most functions are at a crossroad of industry and function. Finance for manufacturing. Finance for BFSI. HR for manufacturing. HR for BFSI. But we got to know technology for supporting all the functions, right? From your HR, finance, manufacturing, maintenance, everything. Anything that you do with technology has a people impact. And that means that you may implement a technology, but will people use it? That's the first dimension. The second dimension is that management of IT is an ascent function. Uh, most of the functions are more than 100 years old. IT is just about 30-year-old management function. Digital transformation, that's just about a 10-year-old 10, 10 function. What that means is that there is not sufficient amount of management science around IT and digital. And whatever is there, it is not fully disseminated. Now, the nature of the industry is that it's a high-margin industry. For anything that you want to do, there are a plethora of options. And therefore, there's an intense amount of sales and marketing as well. When you combine that with the asymmetry of talent, you kind of get a clearer picture. 95% plus of technology talent is on the supply side, either with product vendors or with system integrators. And the very small minority is on the enterprise side. When you combine it with intense marketing and sales efforts, you kind of understand why it gets more confusing to select the right technology for yourself. Now, these factors come together multi-dimensional complexity, two added dimensions of IT looking after entire enterprise processes, as well as the people impact of technology, IT being just a 30-year-old function, digital being less than a 10-year-old function, very competitive, very high margin industry, and very small minority of talent on the enterprise side. All of these converge together to give you the answer to the equation, 17%. That's where Clarity Chat comes in. The science of managing IT is not that well disseminated. Therefore, it's still an art. And how do you learn the art? From accomplished artists, which is the CIOs and business leaders. These are informal discussions over a cup of tea, and that's Clarity Chat for you. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of Clarity Chat. This is the 35th episode of Clarity Chat. Uh, thank you, all my audience from all over the world, for your encouragement and engagement in keeping this going. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Shankar Sen Banerjee, or Shanky, as he is fondly called, CIO of RBL Bank. Hi, Shanky. Welcome to Clarity Hi. Chat. Welcome. And I must tell you, I'm using my special mug. It's a Rajasthan Pichwai design, which I gathered in. Uh, this is the first time I'm drinking from it. It's a special occasion. So. Wow. Thank you. And yes, today is also a special occasion of uh, uh, Basant Panchami. Um, this is the festival of, uh, you know, Ma Saraswati. So you can see both of us are wearing a yellow T-shirt. That's symbolic of Basant Panchami, uh, the color of spring. And uh, this is a very special day, you know, especially from a knowledge and wisdom point of view. Uh, Saras Ma Saraswati is the goddess of uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge, uh, which is exactly what we are trying to contribute to that agenda, uh, you know, with our clarity chats. Uh, the only difference is that we are trying to bring in the knowledge and wisdom from uh, experiences of uh, uh, senior leaders for the benefit of the community. So uh, uh, on that, happy Basant Panchami to all of you. Let's uh, begin the uh, let's begin today's chat. So uh, just on a uh, you know uh, as an introduction, uh, Shanky's experience ranges from MPS's Future Bazaar India Infoline, 
Accenture and National Stock Exchange before he joined RDL Bank. Uh, he has tested waters in all major industries like technology, capital markets, banks, retail, IT services, e-commerce. It's an amazing gold mine of experiences that we will get to dig into today. And uh, thanks again, Shanky, for being with us. So um, our freewheeling chat with Shanky will cover how he caught early waves, uh, starting from internet, mobile, then cloud. Uh, he has engineered unique challenges while doing some high-risk technology upgrades in the capital markets. Uh, and you know, that engine cannot shut down. Uh, if, you're, if you're taking a change management initiative, just hold back till you uh, hear his inspiring stories of Cyclothon and uh, you know how, uh, how employee engagement happened during the uh, pandemic and what are the learnings. And uh, he'll also share some interesting insights about, you know, cybersecurity and compliance. Uh, as always, we'll end the rapid, uh, we'll end with a rapid fire round and then a reverse question to me. I jokingly call it the revenge question because all the while I'll be asking Shanky a question and he'll get to ask me a question too. That makes it a fair game. So, uh, Shanky, uh, before we start, uh, you know, talking about some serious things, learnings, case studies, let's 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 do a fun and energetic start to our chat. Um, now, you shared with me a fun story about Tata Motors. So why don't you tell our audience what happened uh, with Tata Motors? Well, the story was actually not about Tata Motors per se. You know, I used to be in Tata IBM and this was my first job. I was an intern. Uh, I had just joined Tata IBM and I had joined in the internal support group. Um, they called it the IS group. And, uh, you know, this was 80, so 1995 maybe 96 and uh, IBM had just come out with this super powerful 5 lakh rupee laptop which had voice recognition and all that stuff and 5 lakh rupees was a humongous amount of money in 95 you know those days uh, a Maruti Zen used to cost about 3 lakhs so you can imagine yeah. how much money a nine, uh, 5 lakh rupee laptop was so and my salary yearly salary was up 1 lakh rupees <laughs> maybe 2 lakhs something forget but definitely a lot less than that laptop and so only three laptops came, one for Ratan Tata, one for that time the head of India was a guy called John Whiting, a head of Tata IBM India, and one for Mr. Gandhi in Telco. Those days it was Telco. So these three laptops came and they came to internal support team and, uh, you know, voice recognition in those days was largely hype. It didn't work very well. You had to do, you had to keep repeating phrases and all that. And generally it was very troublesome laptop. So, uh, uh, Mr. Jahangir Gandhi's laptop kept coming back. Okay, kuch na kuch problem hai, ye nahi chal raha hai. So, finally, they said, why don't you, since you have done most of the experimentation with the laptops, why don't you take the laptop to Mr. Gandhi's office and figure out what is going wrong? So, I went and, you know, me in turn, Tata IBM, Mr. Gandhi, uh, calls me, no problem, come in, come in. Huh? It gives two, three minutes of conversation. After a while, he tells me rather kindly, see, this laptop is much too complicated for me. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's just that every time I start using it, somebody gives me an instruction manual. So I say, itna nahi hona hoga. so why don't you keep it? As in, you take the laptop back. I don't really need it. You know, company ke karani hum ko diya gaya tha. You keep it. And so I kept the laptop. And, you know, it was quite amazing how nice the man was. Um, he spent like 10, 15 minutes with me, gave me some career advice, generally made me feel very, because I was really nervous, you know, first, first job, first time I'm going to meet somebody who is the head of a very large company. And uh, so then I came back and everybody said, ha, thik hai, yehi bola hai, to you only carry the laptop. Nobody else wanted to carry it because kho gaya to pura das saal ka chala jaya. So, I kept carrying the laptop. So, oh, more than half my career, I had India's most expensive laptop. Wow. So, you carried a laptop which was like maybe two and a half times your salary. Yeah. And I had to, you know, not tell anybody because, you know, pata chal gaya to gaya. <laughs> you don't want to invite trouble. You know, actually, you know, uh, uh, I don't think I told you this, but I was in the construction equipment business of uh, Tata Motors and Mr. Uh, Saroj Gandhi was our executive director oh. and he once came to Hyderabad and uh, you know I basically narrated something to him which I didn't really feel good about 
So, you know, our service engineers used to go out in the field and in the hot sun, um, the daily allowance that they had, they couldn't afford, uh, you know, an AC room. Okay. So someone just jokingly told me that, you know, we actually go to a centralized AC uh, hotel and uh, we sleep with our doors open so that, the you know, the corridor cool air comes in. And I, I actually was very embarrassed because, you know, not for some something like Tata Motors. And I very passionately told Mr. Gandhi about this incident. And I said, sir, this is not done. I mean, no, we carry a brand and all that. And the next thing that uh, instruction that came after after a month or so was that the travel policy was changed. And they said that, you know, whatever it costs, a minimum of AC room for uh, our service seniors. He was, a, he was an amazing man. So I have my personal experience with him. But thanks for sharing that, uh, Tanki. Yeah. And I also want one more thing. That, yeah. you know, just because a device is high tech does not mean it is useful. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so I can I can now say that you know I can add to your early adopter uh, a, a high tech laptop as well, not just uh, internet and mobility. But we will come to that. So uh, Shanky, uh, you know your your philosophy is really inspiring. Keep trying your hand for new challenges. Catch the waves early learn and move on wiser maybe you may make more mistakes and that's truly reflected in your diverse career so we'll go through the insights uh, now you know we have uh, cxos founders it managers and technology industry folks in our audience uh, with a common agenda which is learning the art of finding success with technology so before i go ahead i would request our audiences to share their name and uh, you know where you're joining from in the comment box on uh, linkedin or youtube and uh, meanwhile, let us see who all have joined. There are quite a few people already here. So we have Partha Bhattacharya. Uh, it's an enabling function to other core functions. Yes. I think it is based on the video that we've showed. There's Sumit. Uh, hey, Sumit. Happy Basant Panchami. And thanks for sending that note to our audience. Uh, Amrinder. Hey, Amrinder. Good to see you. Uh, a very regular audience at the Clarity Chat. Thanks for taking time out for this. Mohit Harbola, again a regular. Thanks, Mohit, for joining. I know you have a class at this time. So what's happening? Are you bunking your class? Um, and we have Siddharth Oja, again an old colleague. Hey, thanks, Siddharth, for joining. We have uh, Kumar uh, Walsalam, again an old colleague. I think he was in IBM, if I'm correct. And uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, Kamal Goyal. So again, an old old friend. I bought a PC for rupees one lakh. That was negotiated by NSE for brokers. Uh, were you together at NSE? No, we were together at India and Flying. Ah, okay, okay, okay. In NSE, so have... I used to use Kamal as my sounding board. He actually understands capital markets better than I do. So ah, he was my. Ah. I don't quite understand it. Kamal, please explain it. Okay, okay. No, that's great. That's great. So we have Rajesh Gag. Hi, Rajesh. Happy Basant Panchami to you too. And then Amrinder says that from Shanky, I fell in love with computers at 15 while teaching at a local computer training institute for pocket money. Wow. Okay. So that early fascination with computers and what they could do never left me. Yes. And you have continued to be in the industry, uh, uh, Amrinder. Uh, then we have uh, Pawan Roy. Hi, Pawan. Pawan joins us from Calcutta every week. Then we have Miraj. Miraj uh, joins us from Bangalore. He's also a regular here. Thanks, Miraj, for joining. And we have a new regular here, Mayank. <laughs> Happy Basant Panchami, Mayank. Thanks for joining. Then we have Krishna Vepakuma from Vijayawada. Hi, Krishna, sir. How are you? Uh, he works for Electronics. That's an uh, electronics uh, manufacturing innovator. Um, Ramesh uh, joining from Chennai, Binit joining from uh, Deloitte, Mumbai, Joseph joining. Uh, okay, Joseph, I don't know where you're joining from, but yeah, uh, hi. And Kamal, we have Seshu from Hyderabad, we have Sridhar from Bangalore, we have Partha from. You have Partha, hey, hi, Partha. Uh, good to see you here as well. And we have Raghwan from Edelweiss. And uh, yes, we have quite a few uh, more people and uh, someone special, which is Divya Shlokam. 
so she has been uh, you know she has interviewed me twice uh, once on a once on a reverse chat when like you know she was like when everyone is you are interviewing everyone who's going to interview you i said why not you so let's move ahead uh thank you everyone for joining of course i i have not been able to bring everyone's name up there but let's begin so shanki uh, uh let's begin this uh, in the first part let's try to look through the you know lens of your journey you know just to give a mind map to people as to you know what all you have done where all you have been uh what kind of landscape you have covered so uh, so but first thing where you come from so a quick recap of your childhood a two minute recap of your childhood um did you ever dream of like you know making a career in it or doing something with technology so my childhood was i grew up in a town called asansol uh, which is okay. you know the heart of the coal belt it is halfway between raniganj and jhadia which are the two major colliery areas and is the headquarters of bccl and all that and uh, therefore as far from high tech as you can imagine you know coal and steel this was the main thing about asansol uh so i grew up in that area but um we had very good schools the reason i grew up in asansol was because my parents shifted because the schools were very good asansol is some of the best schools in the country it has around 35 large schools including the first christian brother school the first uh, loreto the first this first that and huge old school 120 my school is about 130 something years old so i had a very good education and a very good time you know we had football fields that stretch from horizon to horizon so we could really play football in a full size field every day and thing like that so i had a great childhood um my computer fascination started when rajiv gandhi started distributing computers to schools oh. uh, there, was, there was these bbc computers that uh, got distributed to all the schools and my mother was a teacher so actually she was one of the teachers who was supposed to teach computers and it my mother you know got interested learned it this that but all the study material came to me and i was a lot more interested and you know so i fooled around with it i learned quite a bit you see micro access was a quite powerful computer and i learned quite a bit of it and i started teaching it for pocket money that's how i funded a lot of my you know teenage years acquisitions including a bicycle you know i had a relatively wow. fancy bicycle for my age then i bought gears separately for it and learned how to fit those gears Uh, there was no internet in those days so you had to go to a library to learn how to do computers and uh, so i did a lot of that and that is really where my fascination with computers started then i went to iit which was full of computers and iit kharagpur had this unique thing there was actually just one prof uh, who started the trend he left his computer science he was from mechanical and they had a computer science laboratory which they left open for any student for whatever reason to come and use no permission required no registration required no nothing you know if you wanted it and there was a computer free you could just sit and start using it this was very unique no other iit had this and even in our own iit very few departments had this eventually other departments started opening up like this and it was fantastic you know that room was always full of people who was fooling around with computers and when you fool around with things you learn things a lot i mean you learn of course not necessarily in a structured way but you learn a lot more than just sitting in class and so that was the real thrust of my computer education i learned how to do a lot of things you know even to hack systems do 3d wow. graphics all kinds of things now that's interesting in fact uh, you know by the time i came to college we had a computer science uh, uh building you know which was again open all the time and you could go and like you know just go with your floppy box and uh, start doing something and so i think they they picked up something from iit kharagpur which was good i was in mechanical but i started going to the computer science lab uh, in the second year itself uh by the way asansol i've got a personal uh, you know uh, experience of asansol um one of the first 65 ton machines of uh tata hitachi was came to asansol for uh, a trial with uh, with coal india and uh, there was nobody who was trained in that except me so i came all the way from hyderabad and stayed in asansol for 15 days oh, okay had wow. a bit of had a had a bit of an experience of what it means to be in the heart of cpim controlled <laughs> neighborhood <Yeah. laughs> and i monitored that machine for about 15 days while others were getting trained 
so that was a personal experience and you know coming to the other one you know when you try to when you uh, fool around with technology you learn faster so i think there was a story that you know some mps were struggling you know in getting trained for the computer and somebody managed to send a expletive written uh, expletive uh, written message to another one okay and then they quickly learned how to send those send those mails to each other <laughs> yeah so uh in uh, yeah. instance we used to encourage people to learn computer many of many people came from backgrounds where they had never seen a computer this was of course yeah. my generation because now everybody has seen a computer but um, in imc 94 93 to 95 there were lots of students who had never seen a computer before they came to imc and we had to encourage them to use it and they were very scared of you know if i press this button what happens the whole thing blows up so we started encouraging games uh, you know computer yeah. games and people of course got quite a few people got fascinated by it and eventually they had to learn how to run the computer to get to the game and they learned enough Absolutely. of it to get by in life i mean that was actually we Absolutely. realized that adoption you can't really control adoption by saying i will only allow you to do it this way yeah absolutely uh, adoption has to happen by taking something that the person likes and letting him discover the path to whatever he is absolutely so we have to take the scare part of it away we have to make it fun we have to yeah. make it a little more engaging right. and all so uh, shanky i've got lots and lots of questions for you so the next question uh, please be a little quick because then we go deep dive yeah. into the next set of questions sure so so tell us a, give us a little bit of a you know a journey map of like you know Uh, which organizations you worked in uh, and you know how that journey has been and maybe you know like one highlight of each of those organizations because we'll get into the details that later. is not a short question i moved around a lot i know i know <laughs> every time I, i get bored in 3 to 5 years so i move every 3 to 5 years so first was ibm you know ibm was first job out of campus and I, in fact i done my summer training in ibm they given me a pre placement offer and uh, this was uh, so ibm was the first large multinational in india the first large compute multinational in india that used to come to ibm so it was a very different experience in those days firstly it wasn't ibm in those days it was tata information systems limited a joint venture between tata and ibm and uh, but it was largely run by ibm and it had a very unique culture in the sense that it has these giant desks it has very luxurious offices even for juniors it had free coffee all the stuff that you think of in us offices it had here and it was quite the experience we used to call it a five star coffee shop yeah. and uh, what i really learned you know we did a lot of things in ibm but one of the things i learned was ibm taught me how to speak to really senior people like saroj gandhi was the first experience but ibm as a policy sends juniors to talk to sen- to really senior guys as long as the junior knows what he's doing so Absolutely. i ended up and i, I be having you know two years out of college having a relationship with many of the cios of bombay the cios in those days some of wow. whom actually wow. are still around today but uh, many of them i i mean i used to directly interact with them not interact with them as part of some team and this was something i am taught me that you know if you are if you know what you're doing and you're sincere and there this thing no matter how senior the guy he will interact with you on his level he will not say are the junior is ko kuch pata nahi hai senior guys actually don't say that it is the juniors who feel that really, it will get started. absolutely yeah that's right but, that's but right. Uh, you have to also have be prepared have the courage you know respect them and so on and that was a yeah. big learning you know um it was a big learning that many other companies did not give my peers absolutely absolutely so yeah, that so was that one very valuable part of it Uh, then ibm say i moved to a startup you know by then we had done a lot of internet work for ibm so the internet wave had started when i joined ibm i had learned a little bit of the internet in iit because uh, you know unix machines and uh, tcp ip networking ibm had no idea of internet in those days ibm was uh, system network architecture mainframes did not connect to anything public and so i you know i found a lot of things to do in ibm simply because nobody else knew my batch the people who joined with me knew and so we ended up doing a lot of different things as uh, across the globe in ibm and uh, so i used that knowledge to do a startup you know the e-commerce startup did very well for a while uh, then of course the dot com bust came and we kind of got busted at the same time so then i joined a vc worked with the vc for a couple of years uh, worked with the telecom startup that the vc had invested in that was my primary activity 
and you know we grew the telecom startup a little bit and then i left that telecom startup because it got acquired i left that telecom startup and joined emphasis emphasis in those days this was very early days of emphasis just after they had acquired bfm they used to focus in the us and i joined emphasis in the us itself uh, they used to focus in the us solely on internet based projects they no control projects they didn't have any uh, you know implementation projects or anything their primary focus was web based projects java html javascript all that and they used to sell this to companies as their niche area of expertise which of course suited me fine i loved the internet and so we did some very interesting projects there including one project for jp morgan called docs uh, document management something like that. i forgot what the story i mean why the name docs but uh, docs was one of the world's largest ajax projects in those days this was before jquery had been built before uh, you know google maps was uh, eventually came the flagship ajax project but this was before google maps this was 2002 time to three time frame where barely anybody knew anything about ajax so you know we took this brave step of again i had learned how to speak to really senior people by then so i told them you know this is the technology that's going to change the world and trust us we will deliver it and luckily i had good people under me so we did deliver it because i didn't do any other programming but we delivered it it ran to nine versions all the way wow. till i think 2015 or something before they discontinued it so it was a very successful project for us yeah and it was then, personally also very enriching it was a technology that nobody had uh, thought about expanding um and then i joined uh, so i left emphasis just at the point when emphasis got sold to eds but i left for a totally different reason i came back to renew my visa i met kishore biani by accident kishore biani said i'm launching e-commerce i need a ceo why don't you join and it was a 10 minute conversation at the end of 10 minutes he said i'm calling up my head of hr you tell him how much you want <laughs> <laughs> it literally went like that i thought he was joking i met the head of hr which are next day he says ha ah, you know tell me what the number is i'll write it in the letter and here's the letter and i'm just furious he said you must have engineered this to go back to india so <laughs> i said no i said to see i really went back to new my visa but so i went back then wrapped up and came back to a future group future group was a very good ride i mean we did very well in e-commerce for 3 years we were by far the largest e-commerce in those days but of course future group had its own challenges they ran into the dot com the, the lehman brothers bust hit them very badly so we wrapped up all these businesses the non core businesses at that time and uh, so then i exited and uh, so then i started doing a regular cio role so ifl nsc rbl bank Uh, but right. in each of these roles i mean there was something ifl for instance we did the world's largest in those days one of the world's largest google migrations this was 2009 or 10 we did 20000 users to google work to, now it is called uh, google suite that time it was called google apps so we took 20000 users and moved to google apps it was one of the world's largest implementations of in those days of google apps this was before office 365 before uh, Uh, many of the other things so and this of course uh, partly it was me being brave but a large part of it was in those days my boss nirmal jain being brave nirmal jain is you know he's a very tough man to work with but he has these leaps of intuition that if you follow and execute on is actually great fun so so we did that that was my biggest achievement in ifl plus we did a few other things and mm -hmm. in accenture i did uh, i helped launch hotstar i did a lot of work on digital banks for a few ba banks especially for dbs in uh, in india and uh, that was quite satisfying nsc nsc was probably the most unusual of my jobs in the sense that it had nothing to do with the internet uh, nsc is a very uh, unique organization because it's one of very few indian companies that handle really really humongous problems i mean today there are many like zomato or paytm or uh, you know uh flipkart and all that all handled humongous volumes in those days these volumes were i mean nsc was 100 times the size of the next guy they were doing when i joined them they were doing about a billion transactions a day a b with a b and now they are doing close to 8 billion with a b again wow. ha huh, how much is that visa mastercard do 8 billion a year so and 
so very few i mean nse is by far the largest exchange in some of these uh, like the world's largest commodity exchange in those days it was the world's third largest commodity exchange so it is a very different challenge and it's an engineering challenge because many of the systems were operating at their physical limits to run these volumes wow nse wow. also has requirements that are quite unique because the reliability requirements of nse are significantly higher than the reliability requirements of a standard business there is no That's fail there is no retry it is extremely real time it is nanosecond real time almost in our time it was 80 microseconds so wow. and now it's become faster i believe but um so it is genuinely real time unlike when we say real time in banking we mean milliseconds which you know is not even remotely real time absolutely uh, so so that those challenges were very interesting engineering challenges and they took me back to some of the core stuff that i had actually learnt in college that we were putting in place you know how to manipulate memory directly how to you know how to optimize pretty much every clock cycle of a cpu because that was the kind of hardware and dependency plus there was a lot of risk management that i learned in nse you know how do you manage risk at that extreme uh, speed so that was uh, an rbl bank has been a journey of digital transformation especially cloud we were one of the few banks finally ventured with production into cloud as in migrate to cloud and there are a few banks that were born on the cloud like uh, bandhan bank was a cloud bank but most banks were very fearful of taking the step from dev ut to production so when i and i had spent a lot of time on the cloud already so i was more confident of doing it and then we did it very fast we did 40 applications which is about 20% of my landscape in 40 days no absolutely no that's a, that's a, that's a great journey i you know that's like you know a true technologist journey um, uh playing a ceo role playing a cio role playing a consultant role so i think i think quite a diverse experience so let me now rise a little bit uh, higher level and like you know let's let's talk about some of these experiences so see uh, you've been an early catcher of waves you know like you know the first laptop <laughs> the first in the i mean being first on the internet on the mobile and cloud so um let's talk about being an early catcher of waves so what is the mindset working behind it you know whether it's internet mobile cloud what is the thought process going through your mind you know so in any anybody in our audience you know if he thinks that you know generally we look at these new trends with a bit of a risk or a bit of incredulity so what is what is what is going through your mind when you are looking at being early catcher so one of the main things is to not look at the risk of it i mean you of course recognize there is a risk but the main point of uh, of any technology is is there enough potential if there is enough potential the risk will be worth it there's risk in crossing the road you know at the moment my eye is bad i have a very high risk of crossing the road so obviously you know uh, there is risk in everything and you trade off is is it worth crossing the road and that's the real thing about early waves you know the internet one one of course i was exposed to it far earlier than most other people so the people had invested a lot in the pre internet world the private networks world and i am in particular was full of people who had in, spent their entire lives on private networks and so uh, so they didn't see why internet was worth it and therefore it was an opportunity for me and a few others like a few other friends of mine who thought the internet was the greatest thing on earth especially because we had experimented with it and we quickly realized what its potential was even something like an email ibm did not use internet based uh, you know lotus notes based email till much later in life i mean when i joined they were using mainframe based email and people used to keep justifying why that was great and we quickly realized that there are yes there are risks to it it is not you know it's not as easy as mainframe based email but there's humongous advantage to it and that is the that is the way we rode and other people also started realizing this advantage you know e-commerce started flourishing all that came to fruition because of that uh, web technologies but yeah. uh, you know so that's the first thing about riding a wave you must first see what the gains are otherwise the wave is not worth it you know but if you first see what the risks are you will never notice the gains absolutely absolutely and especially if you you know especially if you have already invested in something else that's the you know people tend to justify their existing stance by saying the other way is too risky absolutely. it took a long time for even to you know i keep giving this example of shopping carts the physical shopping carts 
you know, you, you see them everywhere now to the point where e-commerce uses that as their symbol, right? But it took a year for the ex inventor of the physical shopping cart to get it adopted. Everybody had a reason why it was risky, you know, or, or whatever, not worth adopting. Same with tech cars, you know, it took uh, in New York almost five years before they shifted from horse car taxis to mobile taxis, to, to phys uh, automobile taxis. Because the cars were very risky. You know, people will die in this and that. Except, but, you know, horses have a lot of other problems. So, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so those things are what you have to recognize. That there is a risk, of course. But if you keep looking at the risk, you will never move. What you yeah. have to look first is yeah. the benefits. No, and so I basically, yeah. 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 Go ahead, go ahead. I basically yeah. became part of three waves. You know, the internet wave, the mobility wave, and the cloud wave. And... Uh, you know, all three of them, of course, I, I kind of stumbled on them. It's not that you put a lot of thought into saying, I will ride this wave. Usually it doesn't happen because you don't really know which one is a wave. Some of them, like blockchain, I spent a lot of time investing, understanding blockchain. It hasn't taken off as a wave as much as it was. Maybe now with central digital currency, it will take off and hopefully I'll do something with it. But uh, you have to keep trying out things. You know, you don't know which one is a wave. Absolutely, absolutely. So, 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 Shanky, uh, you know, let me kind of summarize this part of the discussion. So, what you're saying is that the three, two or three messages I picked up. So, the number one is that uh, every new thing comes with its opportunity and the fears. You should be looking at the opportunity, and you know, build your use cases on it. And then, you know, anyway, once it goes into production, you will have to anyway take care of the risks. So, so, but so don't, don't start with the risks. Risk. But don't start with the risk. Don't start with the risk, and I think, and I think this is as true in life. You know, I mean, um, even, 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 you know, like getting a new job or going to a new city or buying a new house, everything will carry its uh, share of risks and opportunities. So start with opportunity first. The second message that I picked is, uh, and you, you didn't say it in so many words, but I'm kind of gathering it as the audience is also gathering it. Keep experimenting, keep experimenting, because unless you dirty your hands, you will not really understand the opportunity in fact you know let me give you my example i always looked at this uh, vr with a bit of like you know what is it and i think once i wore a you know headset and 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 started looking at like you know some of the things like you know how you can go into different terrains and all of that uh, i kind of realized the you know the the power of it right so uh, so that's the second thing and uh, i think uh, the uh, the third thing uh, which I picked up is that the success is outside of the comfort zone. Like, you know, I mean, you know, your mainframe based email or, you know, whatever you are already doing, that's a comfort zone. You don't really have to do anything to sustain it. Right. But to do something different, you will have to come out of it, make some extra effort, maybe take some risks. And, and that's where the success will lie. So, uh, uh, but thanks for that, Shanky. And, uh, yeah, so you did really talk about my next question was about NSE. So you did really talk about like, you know, managing at a different scale. But is there like one particular incident about, let's say, managing this uh, big infrastructure, um, uh, you know, which comes to your mind? Let me let me let me ask that question to you, which is a curiosity for me. Uh, you know, these <laughs> I, I remember when we used to upgrade or like, you know, do any kind of version change in our infrastructure, we would send out a notice that, you know, uh, there's a downtime and all that, but I don't think in in NSC kind of infrastructure you can take a downtime. So how did you manage your upgrades at, so, at, at that know, kind of scale of upgrade? Yeah, you know we used to face this challenge of upgrade. We always face there's always some challenge of upgrades, and NSC used to spend maybe once a year they would do an upgrade, and uh, you know as in the modern world that you know it became once a quarter that people would publish upgrades, but in the recent times, last five or six years, maybe the last 10 years, upgrades have come thick and fast. I mean, and you can't really keep avoiding them, especially the security patches. So NSC, yeah. that's one of the yeah. things. We were not original systems. We were not geared to applying these upgrades. And therefore, after a while, we realized our systems are becoming riskier, riskier, riskier. To the point where the downtime that we saved by not upgrading would all go away because the thing failed because of some obsolete function. So we had to plan around how to upgrade without downtime. And remember, this is not a uh, an internet system with uh, horizontal scalability. So you bring one machine down and upgrade it while the others are running. 
so we therefore had to figure out how to do up the upgrades and which upgrades to do which therefore and we, we had you know the average number of security patches are in tens of thousands a year so we had to do that many uh, upgrades or at least patch applications without shaking the system up so that's one of the things we learned you know the earlier uh, patches the reason this slow process was put in place was because the earlier patches used to have a lot of system impact you know you applied a patch big things would go wrong but today that is not the case like you know most applications like even your operating system nowadays get patched invisibly you know the entire 50 million people who use windows are not told when windows is patching itself or your mobile awesome. phone apps get patched invisibly like facebook patches in the background every 15 days to all their a billion odd users and so that was the first revelation that patching happens without telling users because nothing goes wrong patches have become a lot more reliable the trick therefore is to make sure that the reliable patches we also patch transparently without telling users without going through the downtime without going through the ceremony of patching we do the ceremony only when we know it's a risky patch which usually the operating system guys are very careful to outline because they are also worried about getting sued so they are very careful to outline that this is a risky patch don't do it unless you do some things and so that's what we started doing i mean it was a simple shift because we were applying the thinking of 20 25 years ago and every patch was high risk activity and therefore had to be tested and you know long periods of this thing and often long outages today patches actually don't require downtime so but we didn't factor those things into our calculations and that's one of the biggest things i learned that in a moving car you often have the assumptions that were built in when the car started moving not the assumptions of today and it's often yeah. hard to see beyond it because you're part of the moving car you think uh, this is how it is and you argue at the edges you argue about making patching faster rather than rethinking the process and under- rethinking the assumption yeah yeah no I, way, think, i think it, I think it saved us of the order of 6 7 crores worth of manual effort this yeah. particular yeah. mechanism in patching where we apply operating system patches unless it tells us it's critical and needs to be separately tested we apply it in the background and almost yeah. none of them require restart so we apply it without a restart and i think i think i think all the you know the the infrastructure automation that has come in the devops uh right. sets that have come in that also make it far more reliable and far more automated yeah. to be correct that's the other thing but, you know we use devops as the instant rollback correct so we do devops to do instant rollback that made our life so much easier apply the patch if something goes wrong press a button it will roll back correct. which again uh, you know the technology has become mature and you know therefore there's no problem taking advantage of it absolutely it absolutely. happens even on your laptop i mean the technology actually is far from i mean it's come to the point where my mother can do it on her yeah, laptop no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it happens in the background you don't even come to know of it you yeah. know and you the roll back even my mother can do the roll back yeah that's right that's right so uh, uh, shanki uh, you know adjacent to this question about like you know managing a mission critical infrastructure keeping a very high uptime and all comes the next question of like you know cyber security now you have handled you know those uh, assignments or in you have been working in those industries which are very very mission critical like you can't afford you can't afford a cyber attack you will lose business so so how do you how do you manage uh, cyber security how do you keep yourself safe some thoughts on that and maybe like you know yeah, a case so, study on yeah both capital markets and uh, banks are quite uh, sensitive to cyber security capital markets because nsc used to be a national symbol so it would get attacked all the time including by state led actors um and you know we had ridiculous situations like once bangladesh lost a test match so some bangladeshi hackers decided to make an example out of india luckily and they tried nsc they tried times of india they tried a few other things luckily i mean we survived all that but for instance we had state level actors try and attack us and uh, so therefore you have to work the reputational sensitivity of nsc was very high in addition to the business loss you know nsc coming down is a national disaster banks have less reputational sensitivity but their financial sensitivity is significantly higher than nsc absolutely because there is a lot of money involved and uh, you know uh, like we discovered in the bangladesh case you can steal a lot of money if you hack well even for a small bank you know it doesn't matter what size the bank is even a small bank has a lot of money relative to so therefore uh, 
both in banking and in capital markets, cyber security became particularly important. And uh, one of the things we learned was, one, of course, there is no end to the number of threats you will face. You will constantly face new threats. And hackers are smarter than you. They will constantly keep trying things. So there are two things. One, simplify your own network. You know, the best way to protect something is to have fewer things to protect. One, because your resources are limited. And secondly, no matter how much, how many resources you have, it is not possible to protect a large number of endpoints, a very large number of routes. So in fact, we had an expert from Israel come and give us a lot of advice. In NSC, we paid a you know, fair amount of money to get that kind of advice. And one of the first things he said is, you must reduce your firewall rules. We had about 2,000 firewall rules. He said, you must get it down to 100. It is better to have a broader rule that you can monitor well than to have a narrow rule that you cannot monitor. He says, if you have 2,000 rules, I can guarantee you there is a rule there that you do not know about. And so a hacker will either find such a rule or insert his own such rule and you will not know about it for years. Wow. So this is, you know, he's like, I mean, I keep giving this example in Indian terms. It's like Merangar Fort. You know, Merangar Fort was one of the few forts in Rajasthan that never actually got conquered. Rajasthan, Rajputs weren't very good at defending forts. They used to keep losing to, you know, Alauddin Khilji and this and that. They got conquered a lot. Mehrangar was one of the few forts that almost never got conquered because it had one door and it had this one single path up the hill. And that's the only thing they had to protect. As opposed to others where there were mul either multiple doors, often four or five doors, char darwaza, or multiple paths to that fort. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so Shivaji's forts were also built like that, much later. They were built to be very inaccessible, except through this one single path. And Absolutely. they are very easy to protect. You know, they are very low-tech to protect. And that's what he was essentially telling us, that you build a small number of rules and you watch them very carefully. You build a small number of things. So the first thing you have to do is remove complexity, because complexity is a hacker's dream or any violator's dream. The remove the number of interactions you have. You know, even if you ask three security questions, that is actually three opportunities for a hacker to understand what you're doing. So thing like that. Try and make it invisible. Understand his behavior. Do it in the background. It's very hard to pull the analytics. If you ask questions, then somebody can answer the question by knowing the answer, by figuring out what the answer is. Whereas if you do by analytics, then it's very hard for the hacker to anticipate that and figure it out. Which Absolutely. is why many of these things, like uh, you know, the that captcha check is a lot more secure than a two-factor. So no, those were his lessons, and we took it to heart. It also reduces the effort because you know a complex security environment is actually pretty impossible for any company of any moderate size to manage. You know, you just don't have that many security professionals. You just don't have that many. Uh, that much skill, you know, to a really high-end expert people. And so it becomes a, you know, it becomes a system with a lot of holes that you you think you are comfortable with because you don't know about them. Yeah. No, I think, so, I think, I think, I think, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Uh, so that was the main thing I learned, you know, to, the main thing about cybersecurity is, one is don't trust anybody. Second is keep your system as simple as possible. Yeah, yeah. It looks like yeah. more rules is better uh, control, but actually that is, you know, it's poorer control. Yeah. No, I think I think I think some really uh, good insights there. You know, keep it simple, uh, keep it manageable. You know, uh, manageable. I mean, it shouldn't become so complex that you yourself don't know about it. You yourself cannot manage it. But I think that's a that's a that's a that's a great insight, uh, Shanky. There. So uh, you know, I'm just. I think we are three fourths of the way uh, down, and I still have a lot of questions. So I think I'll have to cut down my questions now. But let me, uh, in the meanwhile, you know, bring in some um, uh, audience comments here. So we have, uh, you know, Sina joining us from Bristol, UK, and then we have Sundar from Bangalore, Manjula from Pune, and uh, there's a uh, from Codenext, Amir from Codenext. Uh, we have Piyush uh, Pandey. Hi, Piyush. And uh, we have, yeah, this is the one I wanted to bring up, Vijay Sethi. So he's again a regular on our uh, Clarity Chat. He was my first uh, guest, and now he has been a fairly regular audience. Okay. 
Hi, Vijay. Hi, Vijay. And uh, yes, Kamal is giving you a timeline that Google was in 2010. 16,000 years. Yeah, that's probably true because he and I were there at the same time. First migration in the in in the world, and then we have yeah. I'm 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 seeing Sunil after a long time. Where have you been, Sunil? Uh, long time since I since uh, I even heard about heard anything from you. Okay, so uh, now let. Yeah. Okay, so he'll he'll send a hi. I'm sure. Okay, so let let us let us go to some uh, audience questions uh, now, Shanky. So Amrinder is asking you a question. What is your personal thesis on the rise of Indian fintech ecosystem, drivers, traction, innovation, and so on? How does the future look like? So if you can make it a make it a rapid fire, maybe give you know like a top level thoughts. That will be great because I have yeah. I have quite a bit of stuff left for you. Yeah. Too many thoughts is you know fintech. The big challenge is you must. Uh, there's a lot of technology out there that does indeed solve problems, but not every problem is worth solving in the sense that people may not want to pay for that solution. And therefore you must be, you, you, finally FinTech has to become a real business. So you must be conscious of what problems are worth solving. And the second is that, you know, FinTechs, a lot of FinTechs do very interesting work and then they stumble at the regulatory end of it. So especially because Fin is so heavily regulated, unlike tech, you must be conscious of the fact that you might hit a regulatory wall right in the beginning. And therefore, fat in. That's my things about fintechs. There are lots of interesting fintechs. And my my favorite fintechs are the ones that, not the ones that go for the gold, but the ones that build the shovels that other people buy to go for the gold. Absolutely. So absolutely. that is my input into the fintech world, which I find very, some of them are excellent fintechs. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I, you know, I mean, as, 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 as I have been engaging with the startups, you know. Just give me a second. Huh? Just a second. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, I mean, just to just like you know, my uh, comments on that, Amrinder, uh, really great point by him that you know it's not the ones who are addressing the uh, consumers, but 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 who are addressing the, the the middle operational layers. All right, yeah. So there's another question for you here, uh, uh, Shanky, which is about your views on DevOps or SRE. So I'm a very very strong proponent of DevOps. And we should definitely, unfortunately, I found that the adoption of DevOps is harder than I thought. Again, this is the shift from traditional. You know, people end up saying DevOps, but what they do is a faster version of their old system. Um, all manual steps and all that, just, you know, they speed it up. Um, and, uh, you know, DevOps has become very mature. And I have grown up in the DevOps world because I spent, I started doing e-commerce quite early and started doing cloud and startups quite early. So we adopted DevOps because it was greenfield. I mean, that was the thing to adopt. And therefore, I did not realize how difficult the change management is. But we find that, you know, even though today DevOps tools are extremely mature, and you as a long-term DevOps practitioner know that the value is immense. But you always find, why are, not, why are people not adopting it? Why do most companies in India not have mature DevOps? And... Uh, I realize that this change management is much harder than it looks. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, there's another uh, question here on uh, what are your views on protecting east-west traffic and especially in hyperscaler environment? So, you know, I think of east-west traffic largely, you know, you have to segment it as far away as possible. So each application essentially should think of the cloud as its own. So don't do east-west even between applications. Why are you doing East-West in a normal LAN environment? East-West is an optimization method. East-West is cheaper than going through the internet. In the cloud, that is not necessarily true. East-West is no cheaper than going over the internet. So if you do, uh, this is one of those things, every application should be in its own segment, where the only East-West traffic is between the application's own servers. And there you can, you know, because it's completely isolated, you can remove most of the barriers. And then everything becomes a North-South, no East-West. On physical networks, east-west is very important because otherwise you'd have a very inefficient uh, mechanism. Absolutely. But in the cloud, especially on the cloud, um, and especially on hyperscaler, east-west is actually all virtual. There is no actual east-west or north-south. This is all virtual. Absolutely. So uh, let me bring in the next question. What are, what are your views regarding AI adoption in cybersecurity and large BFSI domain? 
So AI in cybersecurity is very mature, especially in the prediction models for fraud, for malicious activity, for behavioral analytics. But I have two caveats. One is be careful of inventing your own AI, you know, your own models. AI models are much harder and I am, as a mathematician, can tell you this for sure. AI models are much harder to make reliable. Reliable doesn't mean failure, which means the prediction is of good quality. It's very hard to do that. You know, even big AI experts have failed in doing it. Models tend to work for a certain set and then fail catastrophically. Or they tend to work for a certain set, realize suddenly they were extremely biased. You know, it happened to chatbots. They were very abusive. Or they started recognizing all dark-skinned people as villains and things like that. And, uh, you know, in a production system, that extreme catastrophic misbehavior can be very expensive. So take well, uh, well tested, well ad highly adopted AI models as your base, rather than trying to build a model. And the gotcha. second is, especially in cybersecurity, because you realize the guys on the other side are trying to game the very models that you're trying to build. So, um, and the other is that uh, AI in particular, the quality of data is important. Not everybody has good data to feed, feed into an AI model. So I would buy an AI model and then spend a lot of time understanding if my data is clean enough and random enough. You know, banks, for instance, have this problem. They use AI models for uh, evaluation of loan, uh, you know, whether it's a person is eligible for a loan or not. But, you know, this one professor pointed out to us in a forum, we have no data of, uh, of people who defaulted because we don't give loans to people who default. So we don't know what causes a default. We have actually only very biased data. We give loans to a certain kind of people. And therefore, you know, it's like if you're standing in a pizza line, I'll serve you a pizza. But you're anyway standing in the pizza line. So we don't know whether the rest of the world likes pizza or not. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that's the challenge. You see, we have a very biased data set without realizing it. I'm telling you, we realized it when, uh, when somebody on, the, on a public forum came and said your data set is biased. Yeah, no, actually, uh, you know, bias, bias in AI is a big subject in itself. So maybe some no, other no, time. You uh... don't know how to do bias in AI. That is what you have to be careful of. People think that their data is not biased. So do some R&D before, you, absolutely, before absolutely. you put faith in it that uh, you're betting on something. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, we have... Uh, we but, have sorry, of... one last thing. But yeah. at the same time, AI has indeed become very powerful. So once yes. you get these two things, please do bet your business on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, keep experimenting as your earlier yeah. discussion, right? Yeah. Correct. So we have a couple of people joining from uh, Middle East. We have Sayed Sue joining from Saudi and we have the Tatre joining from Oman. And uh, maybe let me take one uh, last question on uh, uh, from Sayed. Uh, on what is the status of cybersecurity in Bitcoin? What if this gets hacked and it's not approved by any governing body? I think I think you can do make it a rapid fire, uh, Shanky, yeah, yeah. because Bitcoin, I've got some other Bitcoin stuff for you. Itself, uh, the blockchain is not hackable in that sense. It's double encrypted and so on and so forth. And people have tried for ages and nobody's been able to hack it. If somebody does, then everybody's screwed. What oh. gets hacked are the banks. You know the Bitcoin, the exchanges. So it's like currency is hard to fake, but you can always steal the money from a bank. And that is what happens again and again with, with Bitcoin. There are many banks or exchanges that are not particularly secure and people steal tokens from the exchange. Yeah. And if you do get token, it doesn't matter whether it's approved by any government, governing body or not. It is stolen, it is stolen. It's lost to you. Absolutely. It's like money. You know, money may be backed by the government, but if it is stolen, you're still screwed. So that is the challenge with uh, Bitcoin getting hacked. Uh, the exchanges are getting better. Uh, the early days, the wild west of the Bitcoin world, the exchanges were much easier to hack. Today, they are much harder to hack. No, but there was a, uh, Shanky, there was a recent news about a wormhole, you know, getting hacked and some 300 million uh, dollars of Ethereum coins getting stolen. So maybe you can... So that uh, actually didn't get stolen. Ethereum, he created a contract which the Ethereum rules out. But ah. which ended up profiting only him. And so okay. there was a big debate as to whether to close that hole or not. And Ethereum actually forked out. One did, one branch did not close the hole, saying principles 
and the other the rule is a rule if it has a loophole too bad whereas the other branch closed the hole and refused the guy access but actually the it's still there in mean, the act the coins are still held in a contract which neither party has accessed the, ah, okay. the party that <laughs> owns it has also not accessed it yeah 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 no in fact they have offered a few million dollars to those guys yeah. to return it and without, like, oh. I mean, without yeah. closing the hole to close out the contract yeah, yeah. so um, uh, there was one question which i can't uh, you know not ask you uh, shanky which is you know a passion for cycling and uh, you know how you use that you know uh, when when the pandemic hit you know to to engage the people and all that so tell us a quick story about it we are like just at the end of the hour and i still have my rapid fire round and 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 my reverse question to go yeah cycling i've been cycling you know i've been passionate about cycling for a very long time i mean i, I i've cycled all over bombay since i moved to bombay which was 96 or so and i used to all those days have an old atlas bicycle and thing like that and so subsequently you know my, as my wealth increased my bicycle increased i mean the quality of my bicycle increased but uh, you know main thing about cycling is it's uh, it's partly endurance when you do really long distances and partly it's a meditation you're on a cycle nobody else can talk to you while you're cycling it's hard to talk to anybody and it's hard for anybody to talk to you so you know you're with your own thoughts you see scenery it's a great way to travel i've cycled in lots of cities in the world it's a great way to see a city it's one of the best ways in fact to see a city it's faster than walking which is probably the best way but too slow and it is much better than a car so therefore i've kept cycling and you know we've been doing cyclothons now there's a large group of cyclists many of whom are more much more regular than i am and i cycle with them we go on these expeditions rbl itself has a very large group of cyclists rbl has been holding cyclothon since before i joined and uh, they themselves have a very large group of cyclists which has grown significantly bigger in the pandemic because people started cycling everywhere and uh, so that group also we spend a lot of time doing these expeditions so uh, tell me uh, you know what are your maybe the longest or the toughest to three expeditions so the toughest was manali to lay because ah. uh, you know all said and done yes you prepare you practice this that but nothing really prepares you for himalayas especially in yeah. bombay you climb pali hill 10 times and you think himalayas are gaya but you realize when you go to the himalayas ke thoda difference hai so that is one big thing plus the oxygen thing you know uh, it's very thin air so even though you're going up slowly and you won't get uh, oxygen sickness you nevertheless go out of breath very easily so Absolutely. you don't get sick but you know people will walk past you the local pahadis will walk past you while you're trying to you know go on a cycle um thing like that so that is that was one of the toughest rides i did the other tough ride i did was the tour of nilgiris which is because it's really really steep you see yeah, manali really. is not so steep it's low oxygen but the roads are meant even cars require oxygen right so the roads are meant to for cars to go at 3% 2% gradient whereas in uh, tour of nilgiris Three times, four times that, ten percent, twelve percent gradient. So it's really steep. Even though there's no oxygen problem there, there your lungs don't hit you, but your thighs hit you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. So uh, you know, just on that, you know, when I was going for uh, Kalash Mansarovar trek, uh, you know, I used to every day I used to do this my in my building. I used to go up fifteen floors uh, of stairs yeah. up and down, and I thought I, I was ready for the trek. and you're right you know the, when the himalayas hit you they are nothing like those 15 floor twice a day it's a very different experience so uh, shanky um, uh, you know before we end uh, we are just at the end of the hour so we'll we'll extend it for a few more minutes so let me uh, jump on to the rapid fire round so um, um, who's an inspiring leader for you and why so globally i find uh... both jeff bezos and elon musk very inspiring and steve jobs actually my biggest inspiration and a lot of my examples come from steve jobs even though he uh, you know he had very rocky periods as well but in terms of changing the world in terms of introducing new thoughts and being able to get people to adopt them and i think elon musk is doing something similar he takes an idea he rolls it out and he gets people to adopt it in the same with jeff bezos so these three guys i really admire for this ability to take a world changing big leap of an idea 
and then persuading the world to match that idea and follow with it. Yeah, and you know, and, 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 I mean, and yeah, yeah. No, no, so, that 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 that's great. And I think I think the common thing between the between all the three is that uh, they are not afraid to be alone, standing behind the idea and keep pushing it. No, so actually, lots of people stand behind an idea alone. The extra genius is that they are able to make a whole army follow them. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the guy, for instance, the inventor of tires. Uh, you know, Bridgestone is the guy who invented tires. But Bridgestone tires are actually named after Bridgestone. It has nothing to do with the person Bridgestone. It's a Japanese company that honored the founder playing at Bridgestone. That invented tires and never got anybody to adopt him. So he died unknown. Oh, Lots of people okay. like that. You know, they invent things. They have world-changing ideas, but they themselves are unable to generate the momentum behind the idea. And in some cases, the idea itself dies out without too much uh, you know, impact. Whereas yeah. Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, and uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs in multiple industries has, able, has been able to transform the way the industry works. And yeah. that's quite inspirational. I probably don't have any chance of doing that, but we'll see. Whatever scale you can but do, it, I, then you do it. Yeah. I, I, I read Steve Jobs' biography and, uh, you know, I was like really amazed at the way he stood up against everybody else, uh, you know, for design, for consumer and for experience. Amazing. Okay, so let's move on, uh, Shanky. Uh, Shanky, what, what was the most hilarious incident in working life? Hilarious? to You know, probably the most hilarious is I landed up with the wrong week for my Santa Claus. When I was in IBM, I was supposed to be Santa Claus. You know, I was quite fat. I'm still a little bit chubby, but I was much chubbier in those days. And I was therefore a good Santa Claus. First year, I was, I did very well. So second year, they said, we are throwing this big party on a launch and this, that. And you please land up and be Santa Claus. And you are the star of the show and this, that. And I landed up one week late. <laughs> How come? <laughs> so what was a total tragedy. Somebody else got to be Santa Claus. And, you know, they were so pissed off, they didn't tell me also. So I landed up the next week and I'm calling somebody and this guy is so pissed off saying, you know, what is this? <laughs> it already happened. And we were in deep shit and we found another Santa Claus and all that. And now you come. I don't oh. know. <laughs> anyway. Okay, okay. That was probably the most, so, you know, hilarious. <laughs> People didn't let me forget it for 10 years after that. <laughs> Okay, okay. I'm sure I'm sure you're known amongst your IBM colleagues you're still as as that Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. Santa so, so Santa. Santa. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, to all my audience and as well as to you, Shanky, uh, um, I'm using Geo uh, connection in uh, Mumbai, and I think there's a big and wide outage of Geo, including my broadband. So right now I'm running on uh, my mobile hotspot. And I think everyone around is running on that only because this building was all geo. Right. So there may be a bit of a lag. But let me uh, quickly go on to the next question, which is uh, you know, talk, talk, talk to audience about your biggest failure. So I had a couple of failures. You know, one, one very big failure in NSC, we signed this contract with NASDAQ for our settlement system. And uh, it was a complex contract and we spent a lot of time signing it. And it was quite the win when it was signed. The head of NASDAQ came down, shook hands with us. We had a global partnership, this, that. But it turned out to be a very bad decision, partly because we underestimated the uh, regulatory environment in India. I mean, we already knew it was coming. We just didn't know that it was so different. And we should have anticipated because by then the outlines actually were already available to us. The fact is India operates quite differently from the rest of the world in, uh, in, uh, in the settlement side. And therefore, we should not actually have been looking for a product because products tend to operate on commonalities. If you are operating quite differently, then and we, you know, we burned through quite a bit of money before we realized it. So that was probably my biggest failure. And, uh, you know, there have been other implementation failures where we thought something would be achieved in this time frame. You know, I've had some successes achieving things fast, but I've also had some successes where uh, failures where implementation didn't happen for, you know, sometimes years on it. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, with your philosophy of adopting things early, sometimes you can be early to uh, a concept where, you know, people are not ready. It has happened with me as well. Yeah. So, uh, Shanky, there's a rapid fire question from the audience. Um, this is uh, Jayant Ghosh asking you the question. 
what is the one thing that's dear to you which you which is not found in the social world okay i'm not sure what the social world means but maybe um, the social networking world okay so i you know i uh, i like reading a lot nowadays of course i've widened my reading to audio as well audio books and podcasts and i generally don't talk about it in the social world but i like reading a lot i do a lot of reading um and uh, okay. now as i said i've expanded it to audio so even when i'm not reading i'm reading okay okay so maybe let me take the last uh, you know question and this is something which a lot of people are curious about from the cios uh you know there's always this bit of a business and it divide and you know like when you're talking of like you know being early adopter to technology how do you convince the fellow cxos so how do you engage your uh, fellow cxos in building those trusted partnerships so the first thing is you know you have to focus on the outcome technology we tend to get excited by the technology but as somebody you know i learned this early on because uh you know even in the ibm world when i was interacting with cios we would often tell them this is the great latest and greatest thing in ibm and why don't you just buy it and they would say but you know you realize there is no value for me in this it's high risk but low reward why would i do it and so that's when i started realizing that if you really want somebody to buy something you must understand why what is going to benefit him otherwise if it's a pure technology implementation why would he do it if it's not going to improve his life it's like buying a better bicycle but not cycling um yeah so so therefore the first thing make a case is for you itself to understand what the value is if i'm going on cloud how will the business see better results or what better results will the business see and then focusing on making sure that after the move that results are indeed achieved or it will be called a failed project regardless of how technically good it is yeah absolutely so, so uh, yeah that's the big challenge yeah. on adoption yeah so uh, no i think i think i think great one which is like you know if you want to, if you want somebody to uh, trust you then you have to talk their language you have to solve their pain you have to you have to be yeah. part of their aspiration so looks like the audience has got a gotten a liking to uh, you know this rapid fire round and i'm getting a lot of audience uh, rapid fires so let me play along with you guys uh, my audience okay so uh, here is one from joseph kiran kumar uh, if you were not a cio what would you have been so you know in long term career if i were not a, a technology guy i would probably when i had the choice many years ago when i joined iit i probably would have been an architect i would have loved to be an architect you wow. know i do a lot of uh, you know art and visual design and all that and i like buildings i you know some of my wingmates were architects so i followed the profession very closely it's no longer possible for me to be architect because architect is a you know is a full fledged profession by itself but in those days i should i i always think maybe i should have taken that branch and i would have enjoyed okay. it as well awesome uh, so there's another the recent time another... i'll be an academic now my choice between cio and academic i will you know that's probably my next aim if i stop being cio i'll probably go being Will be an academic or some sort, either a teacher or a student. Okay, awesome, awesome. So uh, here is the next one for you. What is the movie or song that inspires you always and is a fallback for you, Shanti? So one song that always plays in my head is Ajit Basta Hai, because it seems to describe pretty much every situation in life. Which, which song, sorry? Ajit Basta Hai Ye. Ajit, Ajit Basta Hai Ye. कहाँ शुरू कहाँ खत्म फ्यूचर बजार it is a very attractive role and uh, but it's a very high stress role as well so i don't know if today i would try being a ceo again even of a startup but uh, i did enjoy it and it did give me a very good insight as to you know how to run a business what matters to a business what does not matter to a business absolutely yeah 
Okay, so Shanky, we are towards the very end of it. So I've been asking you all the questions. So, you know, I call it the revenge round. So you get to ask me a question in, in revenge of whatever I've been asking you. So I've always wondered what motivates you to do these chats? Because there's a lot of effort, right? And you all already had a fairly successful career. You hit the peak of your career. What motivates you to do this? Because it's this is not a casual thing. You know, you put a lot of effort and organization and my, this thing behind it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Shanky, uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, see, uh, actually, it is started. It is started like you know, just like that. You know, so my LinkedIn uh, engagement has been a lot driven by you know audience engagements. Uh, you know, so I started writing, and you know, like people loved it, and then I kept on doing it. Then somebody said, "Why don't you post videos?" I started posting videos again, you know, great response. And somebody said, why don't you start a live chat? And uh, I applied to LinkedIn and they said, do early because LinkedIn takes about two, three months to approve, uh, you know, a live uh, uh, this thing. Um, but, you know, mine came pretty early and I was not ready. So I sat on it for uh, three months. I mean, what should I do? Like, you know, why should I go live? Is it like just for the fun of it? And uh, this whole thing was baking in my mind as to, you know, what should be the topic and what should be a topic which can be sustained. And then one of the things that kept coming back to me was the business value of IT, because I came from business, you know, for seven years in business. Then, you know, as a technology biz business manager, managing technology for another seven years. And then I saw that I had almost nearly 100 percent track record in uh, in successful, uh, you know, in getting the juice out of technology in fact quite a few programs you know which i inherited as a as almost dying programs which i revived and actually there was a clarity chat session i took on like you know reviving uh, debt programs um and then when i looked at this research happening that you know globally more than 70 percent programs uh, don't deliver their roi which are ramchandran's research 83 percent of the program fail i thought that there may be an uh, there may be a uh, you know an opportunity to contribute uh, to the technology ecosystem because i also think that you know somewhere these questions are not being discussed in the uh, in the loads and loads of it conferences that happen we talk about technology but we don't talk about the roi from technology so once that whole thing got crystallized you know then i started building that presentation now i have to involve my fellow cio so you know they also need to connect to that agenda so that's when I developed that five slide presentation as to, you know, what are those four things which make it very complex and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of explains the why only 17%. I think once that got crystallized that, you know, that purpose gives you that conviction and that energy to go on. Uh, and of course, like, you know, after a while, uh, you know, all these comments that you see here, all the engagement that you see here, uh, people find a lot of value in it. And, um, uh, uh, they just keep me going. In fact, uh, uh, Vina, if you can bring up that uh, chat which I showed you today morning, I got a very nice message from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, you know, which I'll just post here, uh, which was wishing me Basan Panchami and then like, you know, some really nice and generous message around, uh, you know, how it is adding value to him and how, you know, like he appreciates uh, how, uh, you know, I and the various CIOs bring in, uh, uh, you know, that uh, lots of knowledge and wisdom to them in the practical terms. Uh, those, those are the things that keep me going. Vina, can you hear me? Can you bring up that uh, chat which I had sent you, the screenshot? Okay, forget it. I'll I'll I'll, I'll post it on LinkedIn. But uh, that that brings us to the yeah. This is the one. So, ah, here it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it says that. Uh, on the occasion of Basant Panchami today, for people watching on mobile, let me read it out for you. I thank you for being my guru and pray that you will continue to shower your blessings. You've been a role model for many things and now there's an added element to it. Congratulations for the persistence with which you keep sharing knowledge and bringing esteemed leaders to talk to people who are keen to learn via your clarity chat. Uh, he says, I'm amazed at the consistency with which you have been doing this session without missing a single Saturday and filling in wherever the guests back out. For some reason, it isn't easy, but you make it look so. Wishing you good health, happiness. So, uh, you know, it is actually messages like this, you know, which keep me going. Uh, yes, it requires a lot of energy. I wanted to add 
And this is one rare opportunity where you know we as leaders get to add a lot of value to the audience. I want to make the most out of it, and that's why I invest a lot of time and preparation uh, in that, just that you know people can benefit from uh, from from people like you. But thanks for that yeah, question. I I second the emotion that is in that chat. You know that I find this quite amazing that you have this consistency and you produce. Uh, you know I've I I of course don't haven't. Uh, attended the clarity chat before but i've commented on a numerous articles that you written i yeah, know thanks thank thanks thank you for that and uh, once again the you know again it's a basant panchami everyone uh, so it's a sort of festival of knowledge and wisdom the goddess of knowledge and wisdom so yeah. wish you again a uh, happy basant panchami um, and you know i kind of uh, as i said what keeps us going is your uh is you guys attending and engaging uh in the clarity chats asking all those insightful questions and uh, for all of you who are watching the recorded version uh i appreciate we appreciate uh, you know you watching the recorded version as well and uh, please ask your questions we keep watching them and like you know we'll take them later uh in some solo chats when i get an opportunity and uh, thank you shanki so much for joining me on clarity chat today thank you for calling me Yeah. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.